This evening we are in Brazil and in London to assess what some are calling an historic deal and others are calling a failure. What is the future of the planet after Glasgow? Good evening from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, a country so central to the fight against climate change and from where we have been reporting for two weeks now while politicians and diplomats wrangle over the agreement in Glasgow. If it is all about political will and it is clearly lacking here right now, then that will be the test of the agreement around the world. On this special programme, the Prime Minister hails the Glasgow Climate Pact signed by almost 200 countries finally came to the kind of game-changing agreement that the world needed to see. India and China force a last-minute change to the agreement, calling for the phase down, not the phase out of coal. We report on what that could mean for some of the world's most vulnerable people, Madagascar, on the brink of a climate change famine and how the illegal beef trade is destroying the Amazon rainforest, often called the lungs of the planet. I'm Sally Lockwood in London. We'll be assessing what an agreement that brought even the COP president Alok Sharma to tears means for the future of our planet. I apologise for the way this process has unfolded um, and uh, I'm deeply sorry. Well, first, there was the intense down-to-the-wire haggling over the agreement. Now there is little consensus over how good or how bad the deal is. First this evening, our science and technology editor, Tom Clark, looks at what is now being called the Glasgow Climate Pact. If passion could save the planet, climate change would have been fixed decades ago. Young people are leading the movement for change. Look at this. Young people are banging the drums. There's so much happening outside, and if only people would listen to this, it's incredible. If we don't act now, then our planet could be in real danger. The leaders arriving in Glasgow couldn't have failed to notice the voices on the streets. And at a climate summit, that clamour followed them inside. The UN COP isn't like the elite talking shops of Davos and the G20. Here, the world that's grown or is growing rich from fossil fuels is confronted by its peers who are suffering at their expense. So I ask to you, what must we say to our people living on the front line in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Pacific, when both ambition and regrettably some of the needed faces at Glasgow are not present? What excuse? Should we give for the failure? But the delegates here knew that the political realities of getting 197 nations to work together on a climate pact meant failure was always a very real prospect. The UK government orchestrated a raft of ambition-raising deals to cut coal, methane, end aid for fossil fuels and mobilise cash. They may cut a few tenths of degree of global warming. Important, but a sideshow to the main event. Delivering on the Paris Agreement. And by some measures... To focus minds, President Obama, a veteran of Paris, stopped by. We are nowhere near where we need to be yet. For starters, despite the progress that Paris represented, most countries have failed to meet the action plans that they set six years ago. And the consequences of not moving fast enough are becoming more apparent all the time. Apparent or not, many countries who depend on fossil fuels seemed happy to ignore them at the negotiating table, although they wouldn't admit it in public. You must have your own comment. These are not serious allegations. These are fabricated allegations. They are fabricated? Allegations, yes. In the final hours of the negotiations, China, India and others made the move many had feared. 
So something's definitely going on here. The plenary was meant to start an hour ago, yet instead, despite Alok Sharma trying to call countries to order to sit down and begin the formal process, they broke up into huddles, negotiations are going on, and everyone's looking around trying to figure out what on earth's happening. Their play was to defend coal and fossil fuel subsidies. Ruthless, but it belies some important realities. Phasing out fossil fuels too fast would be unjust. Take Ukraine, which pledged to end coal by 2035. At the same time, it's not an easy process. We have 65% uh, of people who actually rely on subsidies from the government for the energy poverty. They cannot afford their bills. And with the fluctuations on the market this year, it's extremely difficult. It's, it's extremely difficult for many people. In the end, Alok Sharma had to go against the science and the demands of young people. I also understand the, the deep disappointment. But I think, as you have noted, it's also vital that we um, protect this package. The deal was weakened but not destroyed, and time had run out. And I propose that this decision be adopted as amended. Hearing no objections, it is so decided. It was exactly what the demonstrators at COP26 had worried about, and the deal also failed to secure the funding the most vulnerable countries needed most. It's a death sentence for the poorest people on the planet, and not only that, the polluters are saying, to hell with you, we don't care, we're not going to give you a penny. So very disappointed. Not disappointed, I'm angry, as you can see. No deal was going to dismantle late-stage capitalism and close the gap between the global north and south. And the one agreed here doesn't even cut emissions by enough or agree to compensate those who are going to suffer as a result. It's a feeble compromise, but it's not a failure. The pact signed here recognises we're in an emergency, and it does lay the foundations for what the world plans to do about it. I feel very hopeful. I mean, at the beginning of this process, two weeks ago, I did not think we'd get this far. I think at the very end, there was a little bit of a wrinkle, and that's hard to swallow when it's so emotional. Everyone's in the room together, and, and it's very heavy. It feels like a lot. But if you told me two weeks ago that we would have got this, I never would have believed you. And I'm very heartened by the way that the whole world has come together because they recognise they need to do more for climate action and keep 1.5 degrees in sight. In sight, but still far from reach. They're packing up this vast climate negotiation roadshow before it moves to Sharm el Sheikh in 2022. If the ambition there is even greater than it was in Glasgow, we could be in with a chance, albeit a very small one. Tom Clark, Sky News, Glasgow. Right, let's go to some of the countries involved in all this. India was the nation that proposed the last-minute amendment to weaken uh, the language on coal. Katerina Patozzi is in Chennai in India. Katerina. Yes, I think when we step back and reflect on the past two weeks of this COP conference, it will be that intervention by the Indian delegation in the dying hours of the summit, which will really stick in the memory, because it was in that moment that the summit, which had this lofty ambition to consign coal to the history books, saw that hope start to slowly but surely fade away. Such a simple change in vocabulary from a coal phase out to a coal phase down. And whether you see this as India gambling with the climate crisis or rather just being pragmatic about its own energy security, it's something which is deeply significant. We spent the day here in Chennai, a city on India's southern coast that has seen many millions of people affected by climate change to guess and assess the latest reaction from India. Thousands of miles away from Chennai, a decision was made that will affect this warming city. In Glasgow, India pushed for the continued use of a fossil fuel that makes climates change. Campaigner Vishwaja was at COP26 and arrived home this morning. So immediately after landing, when I got to see about uh, the term change from phase out to phase down, it was a total disappointment. It seems like for world leaders, 
any world leaders, people or humanity or other life forms, nothing matters for them. It's corporates, it's business, it's money. And it includes India also. India has always occupied a rather unique space around the COP negotiating table. Yes, it's seen as an emerging and developing country, but it's also the world's third largest polluter. Historically, though, its carbon emissions compared to developed nations is still low. And that is why India has fought successfully for that change in the fossil fuel text. It's telling the world we want our fair slice of the carbon pie. Do you think it was fair of India to change the text around fossil fuels and around coal? Last thing the world should do is doubt India's commitment towards the cause. We are really showing up our actions in what we are doing, but we have to be very feasible in our uh, in our actions. But we definitely have to look at our other priority, which is to pull back a lot of people who still do not have the access to basics. If you look at the 10%, the global 10% of the population has consumed a large share of the carbon budget and we still have millions under poverty. I think that's not fair. And India's poorest without coal would go hungry. It's an issue campaigners say the developed nations have failed to hear at COP or properly finance. The global north have all the privileges and the, the problems lies in the global south. But the voices from the global south are, are not heard like how they have to be heard. But as if on ironic cue over India's capital, a smog has fallen, fueled in part by surrounding coal power plants. And this will only get worse as domestic coal production is going up to keep energy prices low. The stance of the, in, of the Indian government asking the rich and developed nations to put up the money is very justified. But asking for continuing the mining and burning of coal and fossil fuel is irresponsible, and not just for the, for the world, but also for India and China and the people who live around these uh, disaster zones. But even from these areas, there is little pressure on the government to change its position. When India does phase down coal, it'll be on its own terms and on its own timetable. Katrina Vitozzi, Sky News, India. Well, the Bahamas is one of the small island nations most exposed to rising temperatures, rising sea levels and extreme weather. Mark Stone is in the Bahamas for us right now. Mark. Mark, a few days ago, I spoke to the prime minister of this archipelago nation, and he told me then he was worried about the language from the Glasgow conference, that it lacked teeth and that it was purely aspirational. And that was before the wording on coal had been watered down. This is one of so many small developing island nations where they are disappointed and they are worried. They wanted much more firm commitments on funding to help them deal with the consequences of ever more extreme weather. And they know that if the warming planet is not, it's not slowed down, then there may well not be a future for these islands on the edge. Beyond Glasgow, beyond the ambition, the forests of Great Abaco have gone. The storm was two years ago, and yet for mile after mile, it still looks like this, a wasteland. And the communities around have hardly rebuilt. And do you remember the storm very well? Yes, sir. It was very bad. It's something I'll never want to experience again. Xander Gardner is just 18, showing us around an island that puts the COP conference and his future in context. This right here, this is, this was actually a school. The money to rebuild from the Bahamas' most powerful storm on record never came. It's a long journey, but we'll make it. Marsh Harbour feels forgotten, frozen in that moment two years ago. Beyond the sound of a slow rebuild, everyone here wonders what the future holds. 
In Glasgow, the jargon is loss and damage and adaptation finance, a push by island nations like this to demand the big polluting countries pay for the consequences here. And the text agreed on is, they say, disappointing. Mechanisms, but no commitments. And it's not just the destruction, but the displacement. So your mum lives down here? Yes. OK. Maybe we can go and meet her. These pods are temporary homes for all those who've lost theirs. How long have you lived here? What about, uh, you know, the next storm? Because that must be such a worry that another one will come. I know I ain't gonna be here. I had to go. Go somewhere else. Where the weather's better. Mm -hmm. Where the weather's better. What's clear is that today's internally displaced are tomorrow's refugees. They become another nation's burden. You, how long have you been here? Um, been A few here pods down, 21-year-old Dominique invites us into Hello. her temporary home. Hi. Wow, look at this crab. <laughs> it's lunchtime this and Mum, Gardenia, is cooking. Any little rain or thunders they hear, like my nephews, you can see like they're a little scared and they go back to thinking about it. So just trying to get back in some housing that's going to, I want to say, hopefully protect us if another hurricane was to pass here again. Chatting to Dominique, it's clear that she's no time to think about the climate science or the culprits because she is living it right now. For her, what matters is her family's survival and existence. And that's sad to say, but that's the honest truth. But now that we're talking about that and how you're telling me about the conference, trust me, I'm definitely going to look that up. The weather changes fast here. It's hurricane season and they're holding their breath. Up the coast is the fishing community of Cooperstown. A break in the rain is a chance for a chat with local firefighter Kirk Murray, a man clearly scarred by what he experienced two years ago, but not defeated. You know, we, if, we, if we give up now, all hope is lost. If we come together as a country, a neighbouring country, we could all do this together. It's a, it's a fight together, because we, we're just a cough. If they cough, we catch the cold. So if we do this together, we, ain't nothing could stop us. You know, the really alarming thing is that whatever the deal in Glasgow, whether or not countries stick to their pledges, here it is probably already too late. Even the most modest temperature rise predictions would see sea level rises of up to a metre, and that would put this entire island community underwater. They are images not of the power of nature, but the consequence of our impact on it and inability to protect against it. Here, they are beyond the pledges, the promises, the compromises in Glasgow. Mark Stone, Sky News, in Great Abaco, the Bahamas. Back here in the UK, we are all assessing the agreement that was signed at COP26. Speaking just a couple of hours ago, an optimistic Prime Minister hailed the Glasgow Climate Pact. All these world leaders came to Glasgow because their politicians are telling them that they need to act. Uh, we've heard from the individuals who are already living with the effects. And yesterday evening, we finally came to the kind of game-changing agreement that the world needed to see. And our political editor, Beth Rigby, joins us now from Downing Street. Uh, good evening to you, Beth. Uh, the Prime Minister very much focusing on the positives, but he did accept that a full solution to climate change hadn't been delivered in Glasgow. Yes, that's right, Sally. A little while before COP kicked off, the Prime Minister described this summit as a turning point for humanity, the moment where we really began to tackle climate change. And in that press conference this afternoon, he certainly tried to put a positive spin on it. He said it was a game changer. He said it had plotted the way ahead with a roadmap to defeat climate change. But if we zoom out from all the spin around it, he also acknowledged at that press conference that with what's just happened in Glasgow, uh, the world is still on track uh, to warm up by two degrees centigrade by the end of this century. That is not what the Paris Accord wanted. They have not yet met the goals set back in Paris. And while the Prime Minister says that 1.5 is still 
alive, there is so much more work to do. And for me, really, the person that summed it up, I thought very well, was John Kerry, the US climate envoy, when he told the conference as it closed that if Paris had built the stadium to deal with climate change, then Glasgow started the race to actually achieve it. But whether it was a success or not, it won't be decided on the basis of what happened in the last few days. It will be decided in the coming months as countries do or don't put forward more ambitious plans to tackle climate change. So after a very difficult summit, I think really it's all eyes now on Egypt on the next COP. And those exhausted negotiators now need to pick up the baton once more and keep running. Beth, thank you. Well, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres described the Glasgow Climate Pact as a compromise. Here's the assessment of our science correspondent, Thomas Moore. So where does the Glasgow Climate Pact leave the planet? Well, before the UN summit, the real-world action by countries to cut greenhouse gas emissions put us on course for 2.7 degrees of warming above pre-industrial age temperatures by the end of this century. That's well above the one and a half degrees, the point at which most scientists believe the climate will become dangerously unstable. Two weeks of negotiations have taken us closer to that goal, but we're still well short. With the targets that countries are committed to by 2030, we're heading for a rise of around 2.4 degrees. Even in the most optimistic scenario, where longer term and still woolly commitments to net zero are taken into account, we're heading for an average temperature rise of around 1.8 degrees. Those small differences really matter. Let's compare the world at 1.5 and, and 2 Celsius, a gap of just half a degree. Well, the number of people around the world facing at least one severe heat wave every five years would rise from 420 million to 1.7 billion. Lack of rain would increase the population facing severe drought from 133 million to 195 million. Rising sea levels would increase people affected by coastal flooding from 60 million a year to 72 million a year by 2095. And hunger would increase as crop yields fall for maize or corn down 6%, with an even bigger drop of 9% at 2 degrees. And it's not just humans affected. The proportion of insects that lose most of the area they rely to live in would rise from 6% to 18%. And they underpin whole food chains. We are running out of time to rein in global warming. The average temperature is up 1.2 degrees since pre-industrial times. And we've already seen record high temperatures this year in North America and the Mediterranean. While in Central Europe, there was devastation caused by extreme rainfall. As the UN Secretary General has said, climate change is moving faster than we are. Thomas Moore there. Well, diplomats and negotiating teams from some 200 countries came together in Glasgow for the summit, as well as activists uh, from all over the world. Uh, we're joined now by Laurence Tubiano, who was climate change ambassador to France, special representative for uh, COP21 Paris and one of the architects of the Paris Agreement. She now runs the European Climate Foundation. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, a simple question, really. Was Glasgow a success or a failure? I think we cannot respond uh, either way. It's, uh, it's the step, the progress since Paris. It, it shows that pressure works, that Paris Agreement works, but at the same time, we have to recognize that we are running running beyond time. We are, we are really running out of time to tackle uh, the problem we are facing. And that probably is a semi feel semi the glass is half full half empty and in particularly of course empty as we hear many delegation in glasgow from less developed countries and small island in particular say the count was not for them so in a way we see emerging countries we see developed countries at least commit to something we will have of course to see much more for next year but the loss and damage issue which yeah. this image presented in your uh, in in your your broadcast is are, are really stunning and it's not tomorrow it's just today so i think uh, glasgow for me is a message yeah. of acceleration yeah i mean because the question is i guess if you were an island nation that is eroding fast, would you say that this was a success? 
I don't think they can say that. They, they feel even they have been left behind by developed countries, uh, which finally didn't want to commit on really have a, a mechanism, a financial mechanism for loss and damage and recognizing finally, uh, even if it's a broad responsibility, the responsibility of what is happening to them. So I feel for them, it's not a success. And we have to demonstrate that their point of view has been picked up. And if we could not be ready to agree on loss and damage funding, these at this COP, we have to consider seriously uh, for next year. And on the top of that, we need really to co countries yep, to commit to more plans. Yeah. And just to finally, the Environment Minister of the Maldives says, and he said the difference between 1.5 degrees and uh, 2 degrees for us is a death sentence. Yeah, absolutely. And they have said now that many, many years, the Prime Minister of Barbados uh, just said, uh, at, the, at the beginning of the of the talks, really, when we will have enough of this uh, image of terrible catastrophes, and probably we are not have seen enough of them. Okay, Lawrence uh, Tubiana, thank you very much indeed uh, for being with us. Well, one Australian senator described the change of language in the Glasgow Climate Pact as a huge win for coal. The country is the world's second largest exporter. Between 2018 and 19, the total value of coal exports from Australia was nearly $70 billion. Most of the coal for foreign markets is produced in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. The state mines around 40% of all coal production in Australia. Sky correspondent Siobhan Robbins reports from Muswell Brook in the Upper Hunter Valley on the country's coal dependency. This is coal country. In the Hunter Valley, a 13,000 strong workforce dig and mine this land. Australians building fortunes and futures from the black gold they pull from the earth. Coal is so important to this area and to this community. We believe that we've got another 30 years left um, of this industry um, to continue uh, selling coal all around the world. So the last piece of coal that's burnt in the world should be Hunter Valley black coal. If we turned off coal now, what would happen here? Uh, we would see social devastation um, and in terms of jobs lost, uh, businesses going bankrupt and uh, people moving away from this area. This community isn't just built on coal, it's intertwined in the very fabric of society. People have given their lives to the mines. The mines have given livelihoods to tens of thousands of people. Australia may have backed the COP agreement to phase down coal without a deadline, but it dodged an earlier pledge to cut it completely next decade, a move supported by many here. Unfortunately, with this green movement, one of the main sacrifices has been our manufacturing. We don't manufacture anything in this country anymore. That's all been exported to China. So we have very little left in this country as far as income, and this is a major one. And now they want to kill it off along with everything else. So are you willing to roll the dice and risk potentially the planet dying? No, I'm not saying that we should do nothing. There are things that we can do to reduce the carbon output, but I don't think that putting a switch in, which is going to act like a nuclear bomb on our economies, is a good idea. This is the side of the house that faces all of the bides, but this has gotten worse. But even in cold country, fears over pollution and climate change have started causing divisions. So what, what is that that you're wiping off? Coal dust. It makes me angry, it makes me worried. I mean, that's in my lungs too. Margot's family once made its money from mining, but for Australia to have a future, she thinks coal has to be left in the past. The government has boosted solar and wind power, pledged net zero emissions by 2050, but it's also signed off new mines. We're about to dig up more dirt and, and dig up more tonnes of coal for many more years. We just can't be doing it anymore for the climate. I think the bell has sounded and it is time for the 
coal industries to start transitioning out of it. This isn't just a domestic battle. Australia is the world's second biggest exporter of coal, a global dealer of the planet's filthiest fossil fuel. These communities have fought and died for coal. If Australia bows to pressure, what happens to the people living here? If it doesn't, what happens to the rest of the world? Is this a curtain call for coal? No, I don't believe it is. I mean, have a look in the backdrop of uh, COP, you've got record high coal demand all around the world. So if there was a last stand to be made on coal, it should be here in this country. In the shadow of COP's first ever coal commitments, Australia is now facing its most important power struggle. The balance of energy, economics and the environment struck here will impact all our lives. Well, climate campaigners have slammed Australia as a laggard for failing to come to the conference with improved 2030 emissions targets, failing to show any desire to move quickly away from coal. But mining communities I've spoken to have welcomed the Glasgow Pact, saying it will make little difference to Australia that they believe they'll be pulling coal out of the ground here in 30 years. And one pro-coal senator told Sky News Glasgow was a win for the fossil fuel. The agreement um, that's come out uh, of Glasgow overnight's a uh, green light for more coal production. That's what India wanted. Uh, that's why it didn't uh, agree to the original text, which wanted to see coal phased down completely. And that's good news for the world because, in my view, the most important thing for the world to do uh, over the next few decades is to bring more and more people out of poverty. Uh, and coal and cheap energy helps do that. situation there in Australia. Well, while world leaders have been meeting in Glasgow, Sky News has been reporting from around the world on the impact of climate change right now and how a failure to get a meaningful agreement on carbon emissions at COP26 would put already vulnerable people at even greater risk. The Indian Ocean island of Madagascar has been experiencing the worst drought in 40 years. Children are slowly dying of hunger as their mothers plead for help. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford and her team, report now from Amber Vombi in southern Madagascar on what the United Nations is saying could become the world's first climate change famine. They're digging for water, having to scoop holes in the sand until waist deep to try to get to the water table. And there are thousands doing this on what was once a river and not a small one at that. It's the starkest image of how severely climate change is affecting Madagascar. And from our drone pictures, the snaking sand scar goes on and on and on. They dig because there is no water. This is all they have for drinking, washing, cooking, after the worst extended drought in 40 years. And this is a country which basically gets around on this, carts. Not many of them, in comparison to the population, have access to cars. They don't even have access to electricity. Only about 15% of the country have access to electricity. So they're one of the lowest emitters of carbon emissions in the world. And yet they are the country which is really feeling the most impact, with the UN declaring that parts of the country are on the brink of tipping into famine. Climate change is killing, and Malalaza is one of Madagascar's younger victims. She's barely got the strength to turn her head. She's the weight of a typical newborn. She's actually a year and two months old, with few reserves to fight disease. She's now got tuberculosis, but is too weak to cry and protest very much. She's living and slowly dying in the country likely to go down in history as the first to suffer from a climate change famine. The health workers have few weapons to fight this environmental war, and without a shot being fired, they're seeing suffering on a huge scale, and they are losing with the bulk of the country so poor, they're struggling to get enough to eat. The weekly clinic in Abavombi is crowded with mothers and hungry children with acute malnutrition. Here, a swollen stomach is the sign of suffering and hunger. 
Nearly 90% of the country live below the poverty line, earning less than $2 a day. They're one of the poorest countries in the world. Soldiers' lusty crying is a good sign. It means the little girl's strong enough to fight. And a small victory. She's gained weight. Her mother smiles for the first time. I'm very happy, she tells us. The young are the most vulnerable. Madagascar is battling after years of failed or poor crops caused by this extended dry period. And this aid is their only hope of survival. They give thanks to the aid agencies. The lack of water has had a knock-on effect with poor sanitation increasing and ramping up disease. Every day's a fight to eat and to live. And these are the ones who've made it to the main southern city and help. We travelled through the south, the worst hit region. The country's one of the most biodiverse in the world with a unique ecosystem and species not found anywhere else on earth, but it's now struggling. There's very little infrastructure, with mostly unpaved roads and many communities extremely remote, so what aid there is, is difficult to deliver. The extreme weather includes multiple yearly cyclones and dust storms, making subsistence farming even tougher, and people are becoming more and more desperate. These young herdsmen didn't want to be interviewed. But picking up rocks and waving their farming tools, they demand money to let us through and then sit down in front of our vehicles and refuse to budge until we do. Our Malagasy colleagues begin negotiations as the herdsmen tell them they're hungry and they need money for food. Our drivers reluctantly hand over cash. When we reach Marofu, the village elder in orange is appalled at the attempted hold-up. Raids on the meagre crops are on the rise here. He's anxious to show us how malnourished the children are, and many are showing signs of acute malnutrition. This is what they've been reduced to eating, cactus flowers, which are devoured very quickly. They offer some relief from hunger pangs, but they will bloat their bellies and cause cramps later. Many have blistered lips and the wizened skin of those three times their age. Of course these are not enough for us, but we've no choice, Hariba tells us. No one has electricity here. They cut trees and burn wood for fuel. So many live in medieval conditions. Rohoniswa has two wives and two large families with a total of 16 children to feed. I can't ever fill these bowls with enough food for them, he says, and we're always hungry, but I water the rice down to make it go further. He shows us his second home a few yards away. He's trying to make stuffing for mattresses. But he's not sold anything, so they'll eat cactus flowers again, he says. The village elder insists on escorting us out. His instincts are correct. The herdsmen have been waiting for us to leave on the single track out. The young men are scolded as they protest they need help. Everyone is hungry. Madagascar has contributed virtually nothing to the world's annual carbon emissions, but is probably the worst affected country. And its people are crying out for change. Alex Crawford, Sky News, Madagascar. Well, scientists predict that uh, Africa will be hit harder by climate change than uh, any other continent on Earth. Evelyn Asham is a Ugandan climate activist and uh, joins me now. Thank you for being with us. What does this deal mean for your country, do you think? Thank you so much for having me here. My country has been suffering, is one of the countries that are suffering some of the worst impacts of the climate crisis. But um, we are, and yet we are least responsible for the, for the global CO2 emissions, but we are suffering some of the worst impacts. And yet again, the decisions made today uh, yesterday, the final decisions made at COP will only mean more disasters for us, more death for us. But again, for years, we have been waiting for the 100 billion US dollars that was promised by 2020, but we are not seeing the money yet. We are waiting for the money, and we need to see it. And 
again, besides this 100 billion US dollars, there's no separate fund for loss and damage. My country is already experiencing loss and damage, and so many other countries, so many other poor countries in the global south. We demand this money and we need to see this money. I mean, do you think, do you think that the money will come? We've just seen with COVID that uh, wealthy countries have promised money to uh, poorer nations, to developing countries on COVID, and it's been very slow in coming. Do you fear the same will happen um, with the climate crisis? Um, I think that money is actually there. It's possible for that money to come, but the leaders are only not having enough will, enough political will to bring this money. But again, some countries like, um, like Scotland have already committed have already committed to about um, two, two million pounds, two million pounds for, to, for loss and damage. So we, we call upon more families to join this, for, to join this to, uh, to provide that money for loss and damage, especially the rich countries that have already caused this crisis. You are responsible for providing the loss and damage money and for the 100 billion US dollars for the climate finance. We are waiting for the money. It was supposed to have come last year, but we didn't see it, and we are waiting for it. And this only means, if the money has not yet come, this only means that we won't stay silent. We will keep demanding for this money because the people are dying, the people are suffering. We are seeing disasters every day, everywhere, and we don't have the resources to adapt to this. We do not have the resources for loss and damage. But again, there are some things that we cannot adapt to, like Vanessa says, we cannot adapt to extinction. We cannot adapt to starvation. So we need to see this money. Uh, OK, uh, Evelyn Asham, thank you very much for being with us. Well, the warning that not enough has been done in Glasgow will be met with dismay by uh, people in countries around the world, like in Uganda, for whom the effects of climate change are already too real. Back here in Brazil, rainforest cattle are part of a multi-million pound conspiracy. Our chief correspondent, Stuart Ramsey, has been to Santarem in Brazil's Para State. A warning, this report contains pictures of one of the herd of cattle being mistreated. This is his story on Brazil's illegal beef trade. These steers are unregistered and illegal. They have no legitimate markings. Some have yellow tags indicating only that they've been sold. They're from the Amazon rainforest. From farms that have no legitimacy, the land has been stolen. But these cattle will eventually enter the world's food supply chain, rebadged as legal. It's a conspiracy worth millions, beef washing, with the Amazon at its heart. The vital link between climate change and cattle is simple. 80% of the forest being cut down here is carried out by ranchers. The Amazon is being destroyed so that you can eat beef. This is what it looks like when the farmers move in. The trees simply disappear, never to return. This is Para State in the Amazon, and it looks like this everywhere you go. Brazil is the world's number one exporter of beef, much of it at the expense of the forest that keeps the planet breathing. A recent audit of the world's biggest meatpacking company found it had bought over 300,000 cows from Para State that had irregularities, basically beef washed into the regular market from rainforest farms. The animals are transported hundreds of miles by truck. You see them everywhere you go. There are 210 steer in these two lorries. They've been traveling for seven days with no food or water. They've been parked here for hours. The metal of the truck is so hot you can't touch it. Farmers tell us that the steers can lose up to 35 kilograms each just from the travel. This unregulated and illegal business is rarely seen. Sky News given unparalleled access into this murky world of beef production by unrepentant farmers who believe it is their right. Proporção de alimentos de produção de alimentos no mundo, ela não tem acompanhado essa essa esse aumento de população. Então seja necessário a gente é, produzir alimentos no na Amazônia. O, o que os pecuaristas da região é, 
produzem aqui é alimento, é proteína, é para saciar a fome do, do planeta. Exhausted from days in a truck, for a few hours these steers are rested before the next part of their journey, a river transporter barge on a tributary of the Amazon. They're driven towards the metal loading ramp of the barge. Slipping and sliding and trampling on each other. With no regulation, no controls and certainly no vets, their well-being appears to be utterly ignored. One of the steers doesn't make it up the ramp and gets stuck. And so began over an hour of brutal efforts to get him to move. The ranchers start by kicking him in his face, trying to rile him to stand. Clearly in terrible distress, the men then force his head under water. They hope the steer, fearing he is drowning, will be spurred on. The animal must be terrified. He struggles forward and collapses. Legs splayed apart. He's badly injured now, and he still isn't on board. Anyone who's seen animals being treated, particularly when they're being taken away to slaughter, know that it's pretty gruesome, but this is very nasty incidents, and that uh, animal is absolutely exhausted. The point is, it's all part of unregulated trade. Nobody knows where that beef is going to end up. It could be in Britain, it could be in Europe, it could be in Argentina, it could be in Brazil, and that's the real issue here. Nobody's across what's happening, and of course, the treatment, any of the sort of usual strictures don't really exist. And finally, they resort to a block and tackle. Ropes are tied around the horns, and he is slowly hauled into the barge. This beef will eventually be certified and exported, and none of us will ever know it came from the rainforest, produced to satisfy demand. Stuart Ramsey, Sky News, in the Amazon. Well, China is the world's greatest industrial power and its greatest polluter. President Xi Jinping didn't attend the uh, climate summit in Glasgow and it was his negotiators who joined India in a last-minute bid to water down commitments in the final text. Tom Cheshire reports now from Beijing on China's crucial role. The world was hoping for a lot from the planet's biggest polluter, or at least something. But China made no new major pledges at COP26, because that really was the plan all along. Just listen to the words of the man who wasn't there, President Xi Jinping. Since I announced the goals of carbon peak and carbon neutrality last year, China has formulated an action plan for carbon dioxide peaking before 2030. In other words, China has its own plan and it's determined to stick to it, no matter the international pressure. That's especially disappointing on coal, the most polluting fossil fuel. China, along with India, secured a last-minute weakening of language on coal, which means it can keep increasing its coal energy capacity until 2025 as planned. It says the economic costs of moving away quicker are too great to bear. But we are where we are. And if Beijing won't shift its emission targets, the question then becomes, how do we make sure they're sticking to them? And what it shows you here is for the chosen period of time, what is a carbon emission change? For, uh... Bi Qingju is a researcher at Tsinghua University in Beijing and, and also at Beijing Carbon Monitor, a project which aims to create a near real-time dashboard of global emissions. She says that China is taking its emissions seriously. Uh, now in China, I see a lot more, uh, not just like national policies, but also responses from local levels, like local governments are really trying to get an accurate accounting for their carbon, trying to figure out where they can cut the emission, hopefully without damaging the economy and balancing a lot of factors. So I really see local efforts as well. With countries now asked to return in 2022 to give a report on their progress, up-to-date emissions figures will be very important. If COP26 was about words, now, it's about the numbers. Tom Cheshire, Sky News, Beijing. Well, according to a poll conducted for Sky News, people in the UK believe in climate change but are not as willing to pay more to address the challenge. Lisa Holland reports from a former mining area in South Wales to gauge the view of the people. 
This part of the world owes its history to coal. Nobody goes down the pits anymore, and in Blynavon, that's taken its toll. But they can feel the climate is changing. Do you think that places like this would have an uncomfortable relationship with climate change? Um, to some people, yeah. The heritage of this town is the coal and the ironworks. And without that, there wouldn't be a town. A poll for Sky News suggests increasingly there's a reckoning over global warming. 76% of people we spoke to accept the climate is changing due to human activity. But almost two-thirds said they haven't been paying attention to the climate change conference. Ten-year-old Mason is amongst those who have been following events. What do you know about COP26? It's doing it in Glasgow and stuff, and people are marching around and all. But Blynavon is altogether less frenetic, and that's part of the problem. Back in the day, this would have been a gold rush town. Now businesses have closed, poverty levels are high, and people are worried about the cost of living, let alone saving the planet. Locals admit the electric car bays aren't used much. Sign maker Yazir says he's struggling to find labour to keep his businesses going. From a business point of view, uh, it's all about affordability, whether you can afford to change your vehicles, etc., etc. Our survey suggests people are split on whether taxes should be increased to help pay the costs of reducing carbon emissions in Britain. 44% oppose the idea. Obviously, with it being milder, better grass uh, growth. Sheep farmer James yeah, Bourne I, I, knows better than most how the seasons have changed. In some respects, it's already too late. I think uh, that, you know, in time the world probably will come together to, to, make th to improve things. But I don't think it's something that's going to happen, you know, in the short term. In the dark recess of the mines Where you age before your time One thing that's not changed is Blynavon's choir, still going after more than a hundred years. Farmer James is a baritone and took us to meet some other members and their friends to discuss how habits in the hillsides are changing. I think that's... In a town like this, which is typical of many towns in Britain, there's a way, way we do put heat pumps on these, on these terraced houses. Now we've got food banks in all these towns. We, we've gone backwards. And I think most people are worried about that and climate change. In our survey, more than two-thirds said they felt pessimistic that the world will make the changes necessary to limit the impact of climate change. I think there's a lot of passion, but I do worry how much of it's actually going to get done. I never the planet needs more than prayers. And as our poll suggests, a greater global willingness for one community to save another. Lisa Holland, Sky News, Blynavon. Let's bring in our science editor, Tom Clark, from Glasgow to sum up where we are this evening and what happens next. Tom. Well, Sally, we need to, um, we need to see everyone deliver on what they promised to do here in Glasgow. They signed up to this Glasgow Climate Pact. There's a lot of details, a lot of rules that the UN uh, put in part of that in accordance with the Paris Treaty. They've got to declare their emissions. They've got to follow those rules. But most importantly, they've got to come back in 2022 with more ambitious targets. That is the crucial part about keeping 1.5 degrees on the table within reach, because right now it just isn't there yet. But most importantly, we also need to watch for what the rest of the economy does. There were some important announcements here in Glasgow about mobilising cash, about deals between different nations to phase out coal, about the rollout of electric cars. There's lots that could happen in the real economy to accelerate things faster than the UN process can move. And that could happen. And that's something to watch for. Tom, thank you. So while politicians and diplomats have been meeting in Glasgow, wrangling over that agreement, I've been travelling to the world's most important rainforest and some of Brazil's greatest uh, cities. It was often depressing to witness, but here are some of the people I met along the way, many of them doing their bit in difficult circumstances to fight global warming. 
This ecosystem is very important. The land griffin said, we must fight for this. It's our land. The Kakama people, they've been displaced by illegal mining and logging, and their language and culture is under threat. This is one way to fight against the climate change. Very, very important, these trees. But it is not straightforward. The disastrous habits of man are taking their toll here. This is my dream, yeah. and here is nightmare. They are not only destroying trees here, they're poisoning rivers too. Industrial waste, chemicals and human sewage flowing through here. This is what man is doing to one of the greatest and most important rainforests in the world. So worried are scientists about what is happening down here below us that they fear that if it continues in the way it is, that within a few generations the Amazon rainforest could disappear. It's illegal, but we can't give up. We must fight every day. Welcome to my greenhouse. The greenhouse in the favela. Come on. I have a dream. I want very, very green hoops everywhere. It's my dream. Green hoop favela! Just some of the uh, inspiring people I've met uh, here across Brazil. In what is, I have to say, an otherwise pretty depressing picture, there is really no political will here in Brazil uh, among the government, certainly among the president at the moment, to tackle climate change. And while ordinary individuals will make a difference, it is politicians, it is national leaders who have the real power to change things. Glasgow has come and gone. The battle for the planet goes on. From Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, bye-bye. <laughs>